Be thou our vision, O Lord. Show us the way you have for us to walk. Take our hand, Lord, and guide us and cause us to be in your will for our lives. Because when we're there, then we find that golden opportunity. Let us walk with you, Lord. Let us walk with you. Amen. I have a question for you all this morning. Are you content? Are you satisfied with your life? Well, I've asked that because lately I've been seeing all these references in the press to a Harvard psychiatrist, one Robert Waldinger. And Dr. Waldinger, it turns out, is dealing with these questions. Are you content? Are you satisfied? And in a major way. He's the director of the longest range study of human contentment that's ever been conducted. It's called the Harvard Study of Adult Development. Beginning as far back as 1938, this study has tracked more than 700 people, 700. The landmark study tracked these people throughout their lives, eventually expand, expanding to include even their offspring. In this unusually long and extensive search, they came up with this central factor that determines contentment in life. In other words, satisfaction. Can you guess what it is? Can you guess this key to living the so-called satisfied life? It's not money, it's not achievements, it's not career success, no, Dr. Waldinger says. The big surprising tech away from this study is the extent to which your interactions with other human beings affect not just your outlook on life, but also how long you stay healthy, how long your brain stays sharp. Having these good connections make you less likely to get coronary artery disease, You're even less likely to get arthritis. Why do I have arthritis in my hand? I'm not sure. <laughs> it's not necessary even to have a life partner or an intimate partner. No, you could have strong connection with friends, family members, work colleagues, many different kinds of relationships. Even casual connections, it turns out, have real benefits. The people you see in the coffee shop, the grocery cashier that you know by name, those more casual times turn out to give us little, little hits of well-being too. We evolved to be, after all, social animals, didn't we? But we're gonna have a chance to hear uh, from this Dr. Waller. He's coming here as one of our forum speakers in the fall. Can't wait for that. I'm working out my questions right now. Well, of course, you and I know something else. We know that God designed us to be social animals, don't we? We know that his primary base of connection for us, along with our families, is right here, is our connection with God and our church. In the Bible, you see all these references to Christian fellowship. Well, what really is this so-called Christian fellowship anyway? Well, it's a community of believers gathered like all of us here this morning. But it's a little more even than that. The word fellowship in the Bible implies a, a deeper connection than coming to church to worship and carry out our various activities and ministries here. Crucial though these are, it, it means our total, our being in one accord. In other words, total agreement in realizing that we need him and we need each other. We need our fellow Christians. There's amazing power in Christian unity. There's so much disunity in the country and in the world today. But when we show a mutual commitment to living the life God shows us how to live, when we put our trust in Him, when we're practicing each other, loving each other as He taught us to do, then in our oneness, in our mutual caring, in our trust relationships with each other, we find a unique bond. We find a unique bond and a real power for living. We show the world out there something non-believers are never going to see anywhere else in any other way. They'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, the old song says. They'll know we are Christians by our love. And never in my lifetime has the world needed more than it does today to see the love of Jesus, 
shining about of us Christians and in how we live our lives and how we care for each other and how we treat others. The operative word here is others. We're called to take what we find here, mutual respect and caring and relationship with the Lord and each other. We're called to take what we have here in church, take it out, take it out into the world wherever we go. The Lord expects you and me to show the world what compassion really looks like. Our guidelines, restated and retaught by Jesus, didn't actually begin with his time here on earth. They were renewed and given added power when he was physically here. No, the Lord's guidelines for how his people are supposed to live actually go back thousands of years before Jesus. This morning we hear these guidelines spelled out for us in the words of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is calling us here to get connected with God and with each other to such a degree that we're living the lives he has for us. Well, how do we do that? By carrying out the tasks he has for us, the jobs he gives us to do. What are those tasks? What jobs is the Lord calling us to take on today? Well, Isaiah tells us here in, in words that God says, are for us as much today as they were for our spiritual ancestors. Isaiah says, you and I are supposed to somehow help the Lord in his ongoing effort to do these things. To loose the bonds of injustice. To undo the thongs of the yoke. To let the oppressed go free. To share our bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor in. When we see the naked, we're supposed to cover them and not to hide ourselves from our own kin. In other words, look out for your loved ones, your family, close people too. Don't live to yourself. Then Isaiah says, when we've done those kinds of things in our lives here in the ways that work for us, then he tells us, this is so beautiful. These are some, of the, to me, it's some of the most beautiful words in the whole Bible. Then he tells us, your light shall break forth like the dawn. Your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call. The Lord will answer you. Then you shall cry for help and, and he will say, Here I am. How powerful is that? What a promise. What a golden opportunity. How wonderful the things the Lord has for us. As for us, if... If, if what? Well, if in some ways it worked for us, we helped the needy. We helped the homeless. We helped the hurting. We helped the suffering, uh, the oppressed. How can we do things like that with our busy lives? Well, we can volunteer at a homeless shelter or, or help somehow get food to the hungry. Simply write a check. It can make a difference. We're so busy, some of us. But we have to stand up in all the kinds of ways we can for the people who can't help themselves. We get the same credit for helping people we know who are friends and loved ones and church members of our church family. You know somebody who's lonely or isolated or hurting or sick or they just lost a loved one. Reach out. Give them a call. Send them an email or a text. Help them out. Show them you care. And we can pray, never underestimate the power of prayer. It is the greatest power we have. And what happens when we do our part in helping hurting people? Isaiah has the answer to that one too. <laughs> he says, then, then your light shall break forth like the dawn. And your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. And you shall cry for help and he will say, here I am. Here I am, my beloved people. You're doing the things, all the things I'm calling you to do, and here are some benefits. One of which, in my experience at least, is a satisfaction, a joy we can get in no other way. I was just talking to a friend the other day, and he told me he's been volunteering in some new way, some different ways, and he said when he gets home, he said he feels happy all over. He says it's a kind of a tangible joy. No wonder Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Because the payoff is a kind of satisfaction we can't get in any other way. 
Now, I started with Dr. Baldinger's study that shows we find life satisfaction and positive relationships with others. I've seen other studies that have built on this. Studies conducted by Harvard and Vanderbilt most likely go, uh, uh, they go a step further. They show that our interactions with others in church also has innumerable benefits. Come to church a lot, you have an Im improved immune system. <laughs> I feel healthier, don't you? <laughs> we have a lower blood pressure. We're chilling. Better heart health, a sense of well-being. It turns out even we, we have dopamine released when we're in church. <laughs> Get this. Regular church members even live longer. I don't know about you, but I'm coming back today. <laughs> Service at five. <laughs> so, one, the Lord says, positive relationships. Go a step further. Two, relationship with, with him and with our fellow Christians. Three, helping others, whatever the need may be. See how the Lord put this together? See how he had it in mind from the beginning? I mean, is this not incredible? Years ago, I knew a Presbyterian minister, a guy named Sid Rigel. At an age when most people retire, Sid and his much younger wife, Bessie, did something a lot of people would have considered rid ridiculous or at the very least scary. They banded together with some people to lease and repair an inner city church. They left their comfortable life in the suburbs. They reopened the church, offered services on Sunday and Wednesday mornings. They set up programs providing food and clothing for homeless or otherwise impoverished people, services for, for drug and alcohol dependent youth. I mean, their work was beyond powerful. The ministry of this husband and wife team, saints of God that they were, made a profound difference in untold numbers of lives. I mean, they could have been basking on the beaches of Florida. Instead, they chose to help transform lives in the inner city. They were prime examples of Isaiah's call to us, to you and me today. They were two of the happiest, most satisfied people I've ever known in my entire life. You and I can't expect to do something quite that radical, probably, as Sid and Betsy did. But we can, with God's help, find ways to help improve lives of other people in all kinds of ways, big and little. Then these words are going to apply to us, my friends, my brothers and sisters, beloved of the Lord. And God says, your light will shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let our light shine before others. Does that mean we're supposed to go brag about helping people? No, because if we do these helpful, often ultimately life-transforming things for others, people will see our actions. They'll shine like light and hopefully urge others to do the same. Let's keep coming to church. Let's figure out how to make it happen. Now let's go out and help the Lord transform the world. And by the way, it's good for us. Let your light shine. Amen. Amen.